Today we have the biggest D3 college football player on the planet according to the internet, and that is Richie Murphy. Richie is from small town Cameron, Wisconsin. He currently goes to Stout, which is in Menominee, Wisconsin, but he's got over a quarter million followers if you go across all the platforms. He's a genius making really unique content. He works with Quick Trip and a bunch of big brands. And we get to tell a story. This is the first time that he's ever done a podcast. In this, he talks all about his first video ever, just with his phone making basketball shots. He talks about when he went viral on the internet when he was in fifth grade, why he he went to Stout, creating content throughout that, how he learned how to make viral content, where he pulls all of his inspiration from, and where things are going to be heading for him after this. So if you want to learn how to grow on social media, Richie is the dude to learn from. So make sure you stay tuned till the end because he drops some really helpful advice through the entire interview, but especially at the end of this one. Thanks for watching, guys. Enjoy the show. Welcome to The Passion Pod with your host, Chris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the feature presentation. Welcome back, friends. Today we're sitting in Studio P, aka my dining room, with a guest who had to drive about 25 minutes, a long journey, to come to his first ever podcast interview. So I'm stoked. I'm honored. Welcome to the show, Division Three football player, Richie Murphy. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. You're more than just a Division Three football player, but <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool, man. You're a Division Three football player over at Stout, um, which, what are they, the Blue Devils? Just Blue like Devils, Duke, yep. Right? Yep. Okay, so you play, uh, what position do you play? I play cornerback. Oh. So short, scrappy little cornerback. Um, You're not that short. Back. What are you, like 5'10"? I'll take 5'10". Oh, okay. <laughs> About 5'8", though. Cool. Yeah, but you're only a Division three player, but like you have a huge social media following between kind of all the platforms, right? Because you make uh, content, you do some videography stuff. I guess for the people in your own words, who are you and what are you passionate about? All right. I'm Richie Murphy, obviously a college football player, but the thing I'm passionate about is uh, making social media content. I've been doing it for the last 10 years. And um, you're how old? 21. Oh, okay, so since you were 11. Cool. Yeah. So the very first video I posted was in my driveway basketball. Um, I just love the idea that you could reach anyone in the world on social media. And I've kind of made it my goal to try and reach as many people as I can. Why do you want to reach so many people? What's like kind of the overarching purpose of that? Yeah, it's kind of to inspire people to chase their passions like you Dope, preach dude. on. Um, even if they're from a small town, Cameron, Wisconsin, you know, they could still make an impact and do what they ultimately want to do with their life. Yeah, it's a cool story, man. Obviously, we'll talk more about it. Um, Cameron, Wisconsin is what, a thousand people? I mean, it's like little, little, right? Yeah, probably about 1,500. Okay, cool. And that's what, an hour ish drive north of Eau Claire? Yep, hour. Oh, okay, cool. So, you grew up there at 11 years old. You can, that's the cool part about like phones and everything, right? Is you can just start creating content, but it's kind of like a scary thing to do when you're only 11, right? Because you're like putting yourself out there to the world of all these people when you're like living in such a small little bubble and you could have people on the other side of the world watching your stuff and like hating on you. Yeah. <laughs> so how did that first video go and like what inspired you to want to even post the first thing? Yeah, it's scary, but to tell the truth, I didn't even think about it and you know, the, the negative comments like in middle school, they almost fueled me because I understood that if people are commenting, it's good. So someone told me that all publicity is good publicity. If they say something negative, I'll kind of just, you know, brush over it, not really care. Do you it's, think it helped you like being exposed to that so much so early on that as you like grew later on that it just didn't bother you so much because I'm kind of the opposite where like I grew up without social media. I didn't do anything like public as far as like on the internet really until after I'd already owned my business for a long time. I'm 34. I started this show like five years ago. So I really wasn't like online much until I was like 29. And so for me, it's been really a struggle and strange and foreign to have people like commenting negative things, which I understand like the people who don't like you are the loudest. And if you have however many people want a, a percentage of those people are going to dislike you no matter what you do. So like it's inevitable. But for me, it's really hard to brush it off and not be bothered by it. I think, you know, my philosophy around that is 
ultimately, if someone comments something negative and you completely stop and stop chasing your dreams, that's when you lose and the, the comments are lost. But if you just keep going on with your life and continue to do what you like to do, yeah. there's no way to lose. And you're ultimately showing that commenter that you don't affect me. Sure. Uh, this is what I want to do and you can't stop me. Yeah, and if actually it just helps you, right? Because it just feeds the algorithm anyways. <laughs> Especially exactly. if you get someone who's a jerk and then somebody else comments and then it just like builds. Let's go back to that first video. It was basketball, so I'm assuming you played a bunch of sports growing up or? Yeah, I probably have played every sport okay. you know there is out there. Since you were like five, like your parents had you in from you were really little? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, basketball before football um, was my main thing. I love bas. I still love basketball. Bucks fan? Bulls. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I love basketball, still play to this day. Um, I'm just more of a kind of a hard nosed guy, I guess. So on the court, I was a short point guard, but probably averaged three and a half fouls a game. Sure. You know, <laughs> yeah. Trying to get after it. And I didn't end up playing football till my senior year. Um, wow. So I was pretty good at basketball, probably better than football, but my competitive drive kind of leaned me towards football in college was it because you're too short for basketball i i don't like to say that but <laughs> you know probably a little bit played a factor yeah. Yeah, yeah sure so um in my personality i feel like just fits more in with football you sure. know the team aspect of football is just unlike any other sport yeah it's the greatest sport to be ever made you know, Americans you, think so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's my favorite sport to watch. And I think, and without going down a rabbit hole of it, I think uh, the salary cap situation, how it all works, like in the NFL, it's the most interesting to actually watch. Yeah. In my opinion. Let's yeah. talk about the video though. So you made a basketball video. What was the first video? And then I kind of want to start understanding how that slowly evolved. Cause it obviously wasn't until recently that things kind of like popped, but it, that takes a long time. I always explain to people, you think one thing took somebody and they just like went off cause they got lucky. And usually it's just like, they did a lot of things that didn't work and eventually something kind of hit. So what was the first thing that you did? And then how did that start to build? Was it just basketball videos from when you were 11 till you were 17 playing football? Yeah, um, pretty much. So very first video, I had a tripod or maybe not even probably just propped it up on a cone, my phone. Um, and I did a little step back move and then I clipped it and put another move on it. And I had an awesome like driveway basketball hoop and a net behind it. Um, and I don't even think it got any views or any likes, but yeah. just like that feeling that I got when I posted, I'm like, that's pretty awesome. Um, and then it ultimately led up to in fifth grade, I had a really good move that kind of went semi-viral, probably like... Like a basketball move you did? And, yeah. In game, in game. Oh, in so game. I hit a buzzer beater in fifth grade. And, and then your parents were filming it or what? My sister. Oh, so rad. shout out Julia. She <laughs> filmed every game from... Oh, wow. From fourth grade to eighth grade. Wow. Um, and I think I was, you know, I was trying to ask her to, what can I do to have you film? Because she wants to watch. She doesn't want to yeah. film. So I don't know what we worked out or if my parents were like, I'll buy you shoes if you do this, sure. you know, the whole year. Yeah. Um, but shout out Julia. She filmed everything. So I hit this kind of like a cool buzzer beater move. And then I got a cosign from you know, an Instagram account, Johnny Stefane, dribble too much. He reposted my video and then it kind of went viral again. Yeah. So then that really showed me something where, you know, you can get followers or you can get engagement, not just from yourself, but if people co-sign it and repost it on their own Instagrams. Yeah. Um, so then that was just drove me to, you know, keep uploading videos on Instagram and stuff like that. Um, and really the goal was to get these outlets or faceless pages that posted basketball content to repost them. And then it'll all just funnel back to me sure. at the same time. Yeah. So your sister filmed all of it was, was that more so because you were trying to watch film on yourself for how to improve? Or was it really just like, I want this to be used for social media, for YouTube, for that kind of thing? Yeah no film was going in i mean i like 
you know, you'll obviously like watching yourself play. Might yeah. be a little conceited, but well, I mean, it's to be able does. to improve, right? Exactly. But when you're in fifth grade, you're probably not that honed in on like I need to watch film to improve. Yeah, you just it, need to like shoot free throws. It was just simply I want to try and get out social media content. Sure. You know, Were like, your parents pretty supportive of that or not? Because like I think about my kids. My kids are 11 and 8, and if my 11 year old all of a sudden wanted to try to like grow a YouTube, I, even though like I do that. I don't know how much I would want to introduce her to it. Maybe because like in this era, it's a little different with cyberbullying and everything that like, I just, I, I'm so protective. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to put her in a position where she's having to face that. But I feel like a lot of parents, especially in a small town would look at that and be like, what are you doing, man? Yeah. I'm not really sure how they felt. I guess they were always supportive. Both of them. Um, they buy you a GoPro or anything. So that yeah, way they, 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 they actually did. Um, they were supportive about everything, I think. And once, you know, once they kind of saw like the views, I think like a 500,000 view video that sure. got reposted, it was kind of crazy to me and them probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, How old were you when that happened? Probably 12, 13. Oh, okay. Fifth grade. You know. Wow. Yeah, sure. Okay. Fifth grade was my peak basketball career. That's where it <laughs> peaked. Sick, dude. Me too. <laughs> uh, but they supported me and once they kind of me and them once we saw like the reach that a potential video could have yeah you know it kind of showed me that this is possible in a way if i continue to just keep getting better and keep posting content but at the same time you know posting a video and it gets five hundred thousand views your very first time yeah you're always expecting that to be the outcome, which is also, you know, it's the battle of two evils, right? Right. But ultimately I think it helped me out because I know it's possible and, you know, I've been able to do something that reached a lot of people. So I don't see why I couldn't do it again. Yeah. Know? It's all about the attitude about it, right? It's like, well, if this person can do it, then I could do it. Or if I've done it once, I'll be able to do it again. I've never gone viral, man. Like never. I think I, I have one, I got one on TikTok and one on uh, Instagram that have like a quarter million, but that like that's the biggest that I've had of anything. And I think it's kind of like been good for me just because I haven't been chasing, you know, chasing a high that you don't reach again. Like that's it's just never been a thing for me. It's been really steady, which means I just need to get better because like I need to go viral at some point. Maybe it'll happen at some point. How did uh, high school look for you during that time frame? Obviously, like you're playing basketball, you're starting to grow socials and stuff. Were you the kid in your school that had all the followers that everyone was like, oh, that's the influencer kid? Or like, what did it really look like for you? I feel like that's what the other schools thought of me. Okay. So other people from other schools probably didn't really, they didn't really like me as much, I guess. But sure. my own school, like I'm kind of a, a weird out there kid yeah. and, you know, having fun. So Sure. Most people liked me and they didn't even think of it as this guy's going to, sure. you know, that TikToker or whatever. Yeah. Um. So my high school, not, no one really cared. I what guess. were numbers like for you? I'm just curious when you were, let's say like 16, when say, well, like, yeah, roughly that time frame before you got into football, but you were like in the middle of your high school career, so to speak, what were they kind of at? So I'd say... On Instagram, I probably had 40,000 just from learning algorithms and sure. learning how to get engagement on videos. You know, you, there was one era of Instagram where if you posted the right hashtags, then it would get a ton of views. And it was just about the hashtags. It yeah. really didn't matter what type of content you posted. Yeah. Um, and that was just me learning that, you know, when I was 15, 16. And that grew me to like 40,000 kind of stalled there stayed there um but then around when i was 16 i was like okay i have a passion for creating content why not try and branch out a little bit you know go to youtube so that's so you're doing everything on instagram at the time yeah instagram okay. pretty much solely yeah and um so then i decided to try and grow a youtube which that was you know, junior year, sophomore, junior year. And literally one of my first videos, 350,000 views. And I'm like, this is wow. 
wow. you know, insane. Yeah. It was a day in the life of a high school basketball player or something. Yeah. Really not a great edited video because I'm still not amazing at editing. Sure. You know, but it just showed the same like I said about the Instagram. It just showed me that it's possible to reach this many people, which also I'm, you know, that's still my highest viewed video on YouTube. Sure. So learning to deal with, you know, you don't have to constantly, constantly keep relying on the algorithm. You can just put out content and slowly grow yeah. and grow your talent. That's also the the good option, I guess. I think you can't force something to go viral. I'm not an expert on that anyways, but it, it's just like a, you can't force it. There is a lot of luck involved when it comes to something going viral. There's not luck involved in as far as like creating good content which will eventually, it's just a matter of time. You know what I mean? You sow enough seeds, something is just gonna hit because you put out enough. Sometimes it happens right at the beginning. Sometimes it takes a long time, but eventually something will go. And even if it doesn't, like during that whole time frame, you're gonna be growing your skills and learning and putting yourself in a better position, kind of moving forward anyways. Um, so why did you, so you're playing basketball through high school, you're growing socials and stuff. Did you at that point, already think like content creation whether it's for yourself or a company was going to be something career wise you wanted to do yeah kind of so the first dream was the nba sure. you know nfl yeah. but after i'd say third grade or whenever you know i started posting content that dream faded and the content became the dream yeah so really my one of my first like goals or dreams was to make it, you know, on social media. Um, okay. Never was playing college football, like never going to the NFL, like was the, was the path even while playing college football. You was know? it because you realized that was kind of out of reach? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's out of reach, but also it's like stick true to the, you know, the first goal, keep the main thing, the main thing a little sure. bit so keep this dream alive um and i just love to compete i love to be on a team i love yeah playing sports and i'll just play it as long as i can yeah well but, and the reason you play sports should never be to go pro in that sport right like i skateboard yeah. my whole life i was never going to be a pro skateboarder but that didn't mean i was going to stop skateboarding it's just like you should do it because you enjoy doing it in the first place and then like yep. if that results into you being able to be a professional then awesome but like realistically it's very unlikely that that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think if you set, I think it's important to like set high goals, but if you set something like that's just extremely unrealistic and you put all of your eggs in that basket, you're kind of setting up yourself or yourself up for failure versus I think if you get creative and look at, well, what is like the actual reason that you want that, right? Like why does somebody actually want to be a pro NFL player? Most likely because they want to keep playing football. You know, like some of it is like they want to be famous and make a bunch of money, but realistically it's because they love the sport more than anything mm -hmm. else. In which case, like there's a lot of careers where you can still be playing football and or be involved in football that are much longer of a career, much more stable and much more attainable. And exactly. if you just like look at it in that way and go, okay, break it down. What is it I actually want out of this? There's probably other options and content creation is like definitely a very fast growing like it's another thing kind of like nfl where a ton of people want to do it and not very many people make it yeah uh, but it is very uh, attainable and it's not something that is completely dictated on your physical ability exactly uh there's a push for sports you know content creators sports youtubers like i'd i'd be willing to bet you know there's there's maybe more people that or maybe more kids that want to do that instead of go to the NFL. Yeah. Because, you know, one, if you're a backup in an NFL team, you know, no one exactly knows you, I yeah, guess. For the um, most part. But if you have a hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube, you're yeah. probably more influential than, you know, a backup sure. NFL player. And that that goes to say like same for brands, you know, when brands reach out to sponsor an athlete or a creator, it's like, yes, this dude is in the NFL, but he doesn't have the influence that a, a YouTuber yeah. would have, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, realistically, the only point of a sponsorship is to get your brand seen. Like that's, that's the only reason, right? So it's like, how do they get the most views in total? 
the most publicity. Well, it's it has nothing to do with what you do for a career, right? That may like dictate the demographic of who's going to see it based on like your fan base or whatever. But like they want as many views as possible. So realistically, let's say a helmet. Well, maybe helmet's a bad example. Let's say like Under Armour, right? Who do they want to get to? They want to get to the people that would potentially buy Under Armour. Well, who would be better to go to Richie Murphy, who you got, what, quarter million roughly across like all the platforms for followers? Would they rather you post it and they get, and I know it's not this exact number, but they get a quarter million people see Under Armour ads from a college athlete, or would they rather only have 20,000 people see an ad from who's our backup on not aren't, oh, that's the kicker. I can't think of our backup quarterback right now for the Packers, but whatever. Um, But like, would they rather have it that? And like, maybe they want to be associated with the NFL, but realistically, they just care about the views in general. Like me as a business owner, which I'm not now. Crazy to think about that, dude. It's like, so to preface, everyone who listens to the show probably knows for the most part, although all of your followers are going to pop in and go, who's this tattooed dude who's (laughs) just talking and talking. I owned a skateboard shop for like ever. Like I opened that when I was 23 and it finally closed. Like I decided to fully shut it down. Uh, last month, it's been not even a month since I shut it down. So I'm not really a business owner anymore. Like as weird as that is, I still have like a brand and everything. Yeah. Right. But, but what would I rather do? I would rather pay for the number of views total to the demographic I want to go to kind of regardless of who it is. It doesn't really matter so much. It's really just about the numbers. That's what advertising is important for. Yeah, exactly. Um, and even like pro athletes now, yeah. Nearly all of them have media teams that are trying to build their brand, which is kind of crazy because content creators kind of pave the path of mark or sports marketing in a way. Because they definitely did. You know, there's a ton of NFL players that do vlogs or make TikTok vlogs. All they're doing is holding a phone. I'm sure they have their editors and you know, yeah, kind of creatives that are driving that. But well, you know, Darton Weaver, right? Yeah. Yeah, Darton was a guest on the show forever ago. We go way, way back. He was um, doing all the content for, uh, what was his name, Rashad Bateman? Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, like, a lot of these people are recognizing that their ability in one thing doesn't necessarily, like, cover all the bases that they need to anymore because times have changed, right? Like, look at Quick Trip as an example. Quick Trip has the best gas stations, period. They're just better than anywhere I've been, literally any anywhere in the world, like, even convenience stores. They're better than 7-Elevens. I'll like argue that yes. any day with anybody, right? Would a gas station care about social media? Back in the day, they wouldn't have cared. You know, 10 years ago, even though social media existed, it wouldn't have been important. But they recognize now that that's such an important tool at this point that they have to figure that out. So what do they do? They hire young people that know how to use those platforms to grow it, and it's done incredibly well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, there's only so many ways to reach people. And yeah making content having a social media is absolutely free um, yeah. you know unless you have a media manager but completely free you need a phone right and and everyone has a phone so exactly yeah so let's talk about getting into football so it was senior year you got into football what drove you besides like you wanted to be more aggressive and physical because you're already following you know following people yeah it's like let's put pads on and i can actually hit somebody <laughs> yeah. on purpose like what what really drove you into football and was it like right away you wanted to play defense or like kind of how did that develop so i did play freshman sophomore year then ran cross country junior year and then going into my senior year Um, we hadn't won a game in four years, which, you know, not exactly fun to be a part of, but senior year, we got a new coach and it was like, let's do this. Let's, let's go win a single game. That was the goal. Like a game. Um, literally we had like our fall camp kind of, um, and I was just like, this is amazing. I love football. Do you have Um, a bunch of other friends on the team that kind of pulled you towards? Yeah, kind of. We had like. I don't even know, 15 new seniors that came out for football. So it was like, let's rebuild this thing. Um, We ended up winning two games and those, (laughs) those moments like were the best in like sports, you know? Sure. Um, And then I just realized I'm like, I probably like football more. Um, The practices are more fun to me. Yeah. Basketball practice. I think, people should just go shoot around and work on your skills instead of like focusing on plays. Yeah. But football, you got to run through like every play. You need 11 guys to work together. 
And if one person's wrong, then, you know, the offense wins. So Totally. Did you play defense right away? Like, were you always playing corner? Um, high school, I played quarterback, nothing else. They, Sick. <laughs> you know, funny story how I got recruited. The stout head coaches were recruiting another player at a basketball game. So on the other team, they were recruiting him. Yeah. And then, just like I said, like, I'm kind of like a aggressive basketball player, you know. Yeah. I talk some crap. I you know, try and embarrass the other team. And the the stout head coach saw that and was like, here's my card, like, give me a call because I just liked how you you played and I think you would be a good cornerback, which is sure. crazy to me. And I ended up, you know, going to stout and being a cornerback, so. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could see that, especially if you're playing defense aggressively. Like, it is kind of similar, a even lot, just like yes. the way that you like defend some, but I, I could see it, because I, like I said, I played basketball. For me, though, I sucked at basketball. I played it from like kindergarten all the way through like eighth grade, and I just like wasn't good. Like, I played a lot, but it just wasn't good, which was like fine, but once I got to high school, it was like, well, it kind of doesn't matter. I'm not gonna make the team. Granted, we were D1, so it was like, yeah. av- I think our average height for our team was 6'2". Like yeah. we we're just not, I mean, that was carried because we had this one kid who was, when he was 14, he was 6'11 and went to our high school. So that, that like boosted a bit, Jeez. but still it was like, I was not going to be able to play. That was like yeah. never going to be the avenue, but that's interesting to go into college and have that be like the first time you're really even playing, not only a position, but playing that sport. Like one year of high school is not a whole lot to lead you up to like, okay, let's go play this, you know, sport in yeah. college. What, did you go to stout? I guess why specifically? I mean, obviously, growing up in Wisconsin, you look at, like, well, what Wisconsin schools are available to me because that limits a, a bit. You know, a lot of people don't want to move to Arizona and pay ridiculous amounts to go to college. But what was it that drew you? Was it just that card for going to Stout? Or, like, why did you choose to do that? Yeah. Um, Coach Berm, or, you know, Coach Berm is a – he's a good guy. And on the first conversation I had, I liked him. Um, it was between Eau Claire or Stout and – Looking at the football records, I chose Stout, you know, Stout speed Eau Claire the last nine years, you know, going, going, oh, going sure. to be 10, hopefully. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I just committed, um, not really having like a ton of reasons why sure. I guess, which, you know, as me, I was comfortable. I could go anywhere, you know, a tiny private school or a big giant d1 school yeah um and i feel like i would be okay you know sure i i have confidence in like my personality enough to make friends and you know build connections and stuff so yeah i wasn't really worried about where i went to college i guess sure a big draw was it sports or was it like um i want to go to school for media and they have a good like media department how why was it really um mostly sports i guess okay you know sure. pretty much majorly sports i like their jerseys and i like their coach <laughs> so that's why i chose that sure did you have some of your friends from cameron end up going there or was it like a okay this is going to be a, the whole new chapter of life all new friends like i get to be a whole new person now yep it was no one i knew went there um which is kind of crazy. It's only an hour, but yeah, no, none of my like close friends um, roomed with me or anything. Sure. But I mean, your graduating class in Cameron must have been what, like fifty? Yeah, fifty, sixty. Yeah, not very many. So that that but makes a lot of sense. The great thing about playing a college sport, especially football, is literally the very first day I got to Stout, I had like fifty best friends, sure. like yeah. all different walks of life, but going through fall camp and you know struggling and bleeding and sweating with these guys that you just naturally grow closer and right the amount of connections i've made from playing a college sport is you know it's awesome yeah well i think honestly that's a big part of and we'll talk about it but i think that's a big part of why your socials are doing as well as they are is because so many people can relate to it Right. Because if you were like D1 star, you're about to go play for the Bears or whatever, you're not nearly as relatable versus you're like in the trenches with all other college athletes, not just football. And so like everyone can kind of relate to that story. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, Most D1 guys, they probably have people to edit for them and, you know, they they hire an agency to reach out to brands and they have people that 
have like a str- strategic plan for their social media. For me, it's just me. I edit everything. I make the thumbnails for everything. I plan me- content yeah. for everything. Um, and I reach out to brands by myself, um, which is unlike probably most D1 people, I would say. Yeah, I think so. I mean, part of it is like, there's a lot more pressure on them to uh, perform. And like they know that if they don't perform up to the standards that they have the expectations for themselves, that their career is out, right? So like they kind of have to put all of their time and attention into that rather than editing this YouTube video and thumbnail, they should probably be watching film just because that's the better use of their time. Yeah. Um, but some dudes are really good at it, man. I mean, you look at like like the Kelsey brothers, right? Who own Garage Beer now, which is pretty wild. Um, yeah, they just like bought a beer company. Now everyone knows about it because they're like super famous. It yeah. was like overnight when they announced that they bought that beer company, it like tripled its social media yeah. numbers. And now like, all at, anyways, they're super dope. Um, but they were doing a podcast even when uh, Jason was still playing which kind of blows my mind. Cause even if they're like edit, hiring out the editing and everything, that's still a lot of time and energy to go into something that isn't like really what's important for yeah. them. You know what I mean? And I don't yeah. think that many people are good at that. So when you went, you made all these friends right away, which is rad. Um, I think that's one of the best parts of organized sports is like that camaraderie and you make friendships. You're kind of like forced to, it would be awkward if you didn't get along with people. Yeah. So you just like kind of do right away. Um, was it, were you making a lot of content with the dudes as a freshman or was it kind of one of those things where like, you're not proven enough in this team to be doing that? Yeah. I did not put out a lot of content as a freshman. Like, you know, it wasn't because the upperclassmen were like intimidating to me. It was just, I didn't feel comfortable enough, like on the team or, you know, as a friend to the seniors or whatever. Um, but whenever I would, or whenever I would vlog, all the people would love it. They, you know, say what's up, blah, blah, blah. Sure. And, you know, some people make, like some of my best friends will, you know, joke with me about me making content, but that's just mm-hmm. kind of how men are. Like they have sure. friendly banter and yeah. talk crap, so. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think it's hard it's hard, maybe it's easier for you simply from like a you've always done it kind of a thing. So when people meet you pretty early on, they know that about you already. Versus me, there's been like a transitional time frame of like I already owned a business and did all of these things and then I started doing stuff on the internet and then now all of a sudden I have people going, man, you talk about yourself a lot. It's like, oh, whatever. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I haven't haven't done always been doing that, but you've kind of always been doing that. So you didn't do it a ton freshman year. Were you, I guess, what are you going to school for? Besides like, because clearly you didn't go to play college sports and it's like, okay, I'm going to play D3 and now this is my career. Like you, you you went because you wanted to get an education of some kind. What, what was kind of the goal and what was the point? So the degree I'll get is, a graphic communications degree okay um you know do you know what that means well i know what graphic design is i know what communication is but maybe for the rest of the people if you can not that i know everything but if you could kind of describe specifically what that is no like i asked that because your like assumption is probably the same as mine because sure it's a really communications is a broad major to do so like to pinpoint what i want to do or what we learn, I guess, is we learn about like advertising and right. types of print, okay. which is nothing like what I want to do. Um, I want to like, first of all, the social media thing is the number one, but number two is work for a company, run their social media. Um, That's your backup. You'd yeah. rather do it for yourself, but if you can't, you do it for a company. Yeah. Okay. Um, which graphic communications is not exactly social media marketing um, in any way, so. But there's not that many colleges that have degrees in social media marketing. I mean, I'm sure that's something that's coming up more. Yeah, I think it's growing, but. Yeah. um, Little Menominee, Wisconsin isn't well known for that specifically. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But I think like my advantage is obviously the resume, but you know, just the connections that I've made Mm -hmm. throughout the years. um, And that's kind of why like, college probably was not needed for me except i really love to play sports and i wanted to continue to do that but as far as getting a piece of paper that says i have a degree i don't really know if it would help me out a ton in 
trying to find a job. So you think more so the value has been just because of the college experience more so than like what any class has taught you? Yeah, I'd probably say most of it. Like sure, most of the things I've learned have been throughout 10 years of making content and talking to brands and, you know, work and kind of communicating in a, you know, professional manner instead of going to class, learning about what a printer is and the parts of a printer. Yeah. So. Yeah. I guess I could see that. So what was the first brand that you ended up working with? Very first brand was Hey Dude, Hey Dude Shoes. So I lucked out. I'm very lucky that before. So during senior year high school, you could not get paid off your name, image, or likeness as a college athlete. And in June... That was like an NC2A rule? That was a rule. So you couldn't make a YouTube channel and make money off of it at all. Unless it was faceless or, you know, completely disconnected from your personal. Yeah. Um, But in June, my uh, senior summer, they passed the law that college athletes could get paid from their name image and likeness and i was just like wow this is perfect timing and i need to capitalize on this um and me my idea of capitalizing on it was make money off youtube because by then i already had monetization on for youtube so even if i get paid 100 bucks a month that's a win in my book totally um so then it took me it took me until, you know, after sophomore year of college to get my first brand deal. Okay. Because, you know, I'm not really sure why. I just wasn't pursuing sure. um, any brand deals because I didn't really think it would be possible. Um, because you wasn't, you weren't a prolific enough player, or why? Yeah, because most of um, <clears throat> most of the NIL deals are because of play on the field. Yeah. And. I didn't even play until junior year. So I hadn't played a snap of college football. Um, You're warming the bench. Exactly. Yeah. Um, An NIL deal is name, image, likeness yep. is what that stands for. And it, that goes for everything. NIL, you know, yeah. But I don't think that many people like know that term because I Googled it. When I saw you like posting on a lot of your things, you've been talking about NIL, NIL deals. And I'm like, I don't know what that refers to. I'll talk like quick little background of it. Yeah. So NIL, <clears throat> you know, Alabama football is a billion dollar business or I don't know if it's a billion, but huge roll tide. A couple yeah. hundred million at yeah. least. Um, and previously college athletes didn't get a cent of that. So in 2021, the NC decided, NCAA decided that letting these college athletes get brand deals and promote local businesses, promote, you know, Nike would be a good way to kind of supplement the 10 years or 50 years beforehand that no, nobody got paid. Um, so then after that got passed, there was a ton of companies that or agencies that formed. So these agencies connect athletes to brands and they take a percent. Right. Um, a lot of a lot of the time the percent's not disclosed. So that that leads me to my first brand deal with Hey Dude. It was, you know, two hundred dollar two hundred dollar deal to post like three times about these shoes, which with the following that I had at the time is pretty pretty underpaid so yeah and i didn't know that you kind of just have to learn throughout you know your journey yeah um but i think these agencies are kind of trying to um you know rip off college athletes yeah totally because they take a percent whatnot but it's also great opportunity you know you don't have the time to reach out as a college athlete you don't have the time yeah um it's so hard so they do it for you um And then you sign up for a brand. So I signed up for Hey Dude. I got it. I accepted it. I posted it. Um, I probably did about five or six NIL deals like that through these various agencies. There's 50 of them that 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 are constantly reaching out to brands and trying to get more athletes to sign up. So the Hey Dude one came from an agency. Yep. Hey Dude. um, Quest Nutrition was was a big one that I got. 
all from agencies. Yeah. Um, How did the rest of your team feel about you getting an NIL deal when you weren't like the star of the team versus the stars weren't getting deals? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a weird dynamic, I guess. Like yeah. we had like almost like a second team all American receiver. Yeah. And he had like a thousand followers, but he couldn't get an NIL deal right, with yeah. anybody. But so it was a weird dynamic, but I think most people were, you know, it's cool to see a D three guy, no matter who you are, get deals. But after about five deals with these agencies, I decided like I don't know what percent they're taking. Um, and I don't know my price because it's hard to figure out what a sponsored post would be worth. But then I decided to try and do it on my own and reach out to a whole bunch of companies. And ultimately that led to Quick Trip, which- That was all super recent though, right? Super recent. Yeah, okay. Um, I have people that reach out for like free product, which is awesome. Like, yeah, yeah of course. Like, if you send Richie a pack of whatever, he'll post on his story, and I think that's awesome. Like anything yeah. free is sick. So, sure. but right now I'm kind of, I'm kind of comfortable where I'm at with like deals. I don't want to saturate it too much, but I also understand I want to get the most out of you know the last year of college. So. I'll probably look to find another deal probably next month around then. I think a big part of it is just the learning the business side of it, right? Like you don't want to undersell yourself on things, but I always try to explain to people that if something's going to benefit you from a learning standpoint, that outweighs some of the financial things, right? So like I paint uh, a lot of murals. Okay, so if I, and I, I never went to art school, if I get an opportunity to paint something that I feel like I'm gonna learn something valuable from and it's gonna be helpful for my portfolio, I will do it for less money than if it's something that I don't think I'm necessarily learning from, right? And so even though you're taking a deal that is like really underpaid, and there's a lot of companies that do that, unfortunately, as long as it's teaching you like, okay, this is how this contract works. Like, this is what I can expect out of myself or how frequently I can post. This is how I can go about making a sponsored post where it still makes sense with my brand. It's like, you're learning a lot throughout that time frame. So it's, it, it doesn't really matter if you don't make a lot of money, right? Like you go to school, college, and you pay to learn, you know, versus these other deals, you're not getting paid enough, but you're still getting paid to learn. Yeah. So I think there's a, a lot of value there. And obviously things are gonna have to change for you when you finish school because your content can't be in the college locker room being part of the team because you won't be anymore. But a lot of that stuff will still carry over, I would assume. Yeah, exactly. After college is gonna be an interesting, I mean, really in five months, it's gonna be interesting that I'm done with sports. It's been the major part of my you know, social media. Or oh, YouTube. this season will be your last season? This season is my last season. Wow. So. I'm super excited. Obviously, I love football. I wish I could play for the rest of my life. Yeah. But super excited about the opportunities that come and kind of what avenue I want to go down. Yeah. Um, as far as YouTube videos go, I'm just excited for the opportunities to really try and capture engagement and more go into a you know more of a Mr. Beast type of Sick. content style. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because vlogs are really hard to get views on and get uh -huh. a new audience just because there's no, you know, clickbait nature. You right. can't, you can't really do something in your day that's going to make people click on it and watch. So, yeah, you know, I'll transform into, you know, more structured, um, more strategic videos, I guess. And YouTube is going to be the platform you're going to really focus on, you think? Yeah, I think for one, the you know, the revenue on YouTube is the best of any social media. Yeah. So I'll continue to post, you know, short form content, but really trying to get an audience that likes me for me mm -hmm. during this season is my main focus. Um, I'm looking to do a daily vlog during fall camp and oh, then sure. just backload it, the editing part because I won't have time to edit it, but backload it. Um, and then try and capture an audience that likes me and then hopefully that'll be you know some people and after i 
transform my content. They'll just like watching me, so they'll watch anyway. Do you so. ever struggle with your self-worth being attached to what those numbers are? Because there's a lot of that, I think, where you start having this identity that's based on what these things are. And numbers can be a great thing or a horrible thing, depending on how they're going for you. You know what I mean? Does that affect you a lot personally with your day-to-day -day, like self-esteem? Or are you able to really compartmentalize it and have it not bother you? Um... Yeah, a lot I of pressure to say, I want everyone on the internet to like me, not everyone, exactly. but you know, a lot yeah. of people. And that's exactly it. Like there is a lot of pressure, but it goes up and down. Like the views go up, they go down. You, you know, you hit a certain part of YouTube that likes your video. They go up and down and, and really your emotions, my emotions are kind of connected to it. But the way I look at it is no matter if I am like, oh, this sucks how I feel. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. And that kind of like that commitment to making content, you know, every day or as much as I can ultimately gets me through the, the lows of not getting a high view video. Yeah. I guess I think of it like, uh, if you look at a climb, right? Like you say the numbers go up and down. They do as far as like the number of views you get in a day go up and down, but your number of overall views period does not go down right? It only ever goes up. So it, it goes up at this rate and then it goes up at this rate and then it goes up at that rate, but you're still just overall going up. It never, it never goes down. So it's hard. You can't get down on yourself too much for that. It's like, even if you, every time you're making a video, even if it doesn't get a ton of views is still getting some, which is still contributing overall to that journey and that overall growth. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it, what, more recently, you've had some videos go pretty crazy, right? So let's talk about those a little bit. What were, cause you had the viral videos way, 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 way back when, but, and I know it's never one thing that really takes off, but I feel like it's been pretty recently. You've had like a decent number of them all take off. Is that right? Yeah. And that's just kind of, you know, stealing like an artist and learning from other people and learning from the algorithm on Instagram. Like you, you look at someone's video and you kind of and try and decide why did it do so good and then try and replicate that in your own way or you know that's why i say anybody could do this and anybody could make content because the the learnings are on the platform what you see on tiktok is what the audience likes yeah. so how can you make that into your own um and do that and and see if it works. If not, try something else. Go back on TikTok, scroll through pages that are similar to you and see what worked for them. Try and copy that. I mean, that's all that like social media mark or uh, social media managers do for businesses. Like, yeah. you know, there's those, you know, what like pretty much all social media managers do the same thing and try and find ads that work. Right. You know, hooks and different intro videos and different stuff like that it's pretty much all similar and almost all of them work but it, i mean it's hard to be a hundred percent innovative in art or literally anything at all right yeah. like you're always drawing inspiration from somewhere look at even sports like people who want to improve in your position you watch what somebody else who's better than you is doing and then you try to do whatever that thing is. When yeah. you're a little kid and you're watching LeBron James do a little fadeaway, it's like, how do I do that? Like you're always trying to replicate what somebody better than you is doing. How do you do that when you don't have anybody around you that like you can lean on as a resource? Because it's easy easier to grow, I think, in any area of life if you surround yourself with people that are further along and more knowledgeable than you are in whatever that thing is you want to learn. If it's real estate, you go hang out with people who know real estate, right? Um, you're around other football players, but you don't have anybody else immediately available to you. Of course you can online, but you don't have anybody else immediately available to you to really like learn from. Is that difficult? Or do you just like find people online and you send them messages like, Hey, critique yeah. me. Like how do you kind of grow like that? Yeah. I'd say like my network of the people I know, um, is all over the world, like all over the U US and some even overseas. Like, you know, I try and, I try and be friends with people that are trying to get after it um, in a similar sense as me. Mm -hmm. So I'll follow them, I'll DM them, hey, what's up, man? I'll introduce myself and then we follow each other um, pretty much forever. And yeah. I wouldn't say we're best friends 
Um, but I definitely can, you know, ask them questions. I can look at what works for them. They can do the same for me. Um, and yeah, I don't really find it too hard. Um, the one thing I will say that's hard is in college, not many people are starting a business or taking life as seriously, you know, they're, they're, they're partying or, you know, skipping class, doing things that don't benefit them. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to find people that are trying to get after it. Um, yeah. And so if, if someone like from Wisconsin pops up and I see they started a business, I'm like, let's go. Like, sure. I want to be friends with you. Yeah. Let's support each other and let's grow together. Which is why we're doing this, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Cause I found you on the internet, I think through quick trip or something. And I was like, what there's a d3 college student that's like making content that my other friends know i need to know who this kid is this yeah. is pretty sick i found with myself that like in my sphere all my friends i shouldn't say all my friends a lot of people i was friends with were all skateboarders you know because i owned the skateboard shop for 10 years so like those were my friends but then once i started doing a podcast i was like dude i don't know anyone really who does a podcast so it was kind of hard to like learn from you know what i mean and content in general and then as i've done more and more what a lot of my friends and i still have my same few like best friends that I don't consult work with. They're just like my personal best friends. Um, but my network of friendships, which I do think they are my friends because I would hang out with them regardless of that. Um, a lot of them have came through the show. And I think it's because I meet people that are trying to get after it. They have a fire under them, however you want to like word it. But I'm meeting other people who are really trying to do something similar, who are motivated. And then it's interesting because I can see what they're doing and pull from it and go, okay, that inspires me to want to try to do this thing or that thing or whatever. Like one good example, which I think is part of why your video did so well, is you put out one not long ago that was like, I'm going to get or reach out to 100 brands you know, and see however many I can get deals from. That's a really good lesson to tell people that like, you need to expect most people to say no, regardless of how much value you bring them. Yeah. Most brands are gonna say no to you. But if you push through, you can get 10 people to say yes by hearing all of those no's. That's a good lesson that most people aren't like, they don't, they're not willing to put themselves through that because it's hard. Hearing no sucks from people. Ha having somebody, whether it's a brand or a person, deny you and tell you, nah, I'm not interested. That kind of sucks, man. Yeah. And even that video, I'll talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So there's, there's trendy YouTube titles and titles are very important on YouTube. So there's a kind of a trend. I asked a hundred blank for blank. So I asked a hundred drive throughs for secret items or whatever. I think Ryan Trahan did a video that I asked a hundred something for something so i looked at that and i'm like okay how can i incorporate that into you know my content i didn't want it i wanted it to be revolved around nil because no one talks about that no one on youtube there's no creator in college sports that talk about getting nil deals so i wanted to incorporate that um and as far as the video editing goes like super quick i looked at some of the sort of videos i asked 100 drive throughs for hidden items i looked at the editing on that video and like completely copied it into my own word but i would still consider that video to be one of my most like unique videos and yeah, totally. one of a kind videos that i've ever made mm -hmm. but everything all the little parts were taken from different people so it's it, there's a balance between just pl flat off ripping off which you know there's a saying like even if you do who cares like yeah no one cares if you did like people might get mad but you could still win and be if you do you it know. better you're not fully ripping off i get it like stealing someone's idea totally understand that um but it's also kind of just part of business right yeah like if you can see what somebody's doing and then just do it better like it's kind of their own fault for not doing a good job Right? It's yeah. like you should just and everyone pulls, man. It's like I forget what the saying is, but it's basically like a great artist. You can't tell where they get or got inspiration from, but they got it from somewhere. Yeah. Like you don't. There's very few things that people create that didn't come from somewhere. I could almost always point. I could point out for myself, like kind of anything that I do where I pulled out this one thing from. Just hopefully not everybody can tell where it comes from. But with YouTube trends and everything or any in general social media. Like you said, the, the lessons are kind of out there. 
Like it would be nice if there were like more tutorials and stuff that were up to date and accurate and taught you how to do these things. But all you have to do is learn by somebody else's example. And the examples are right in front of you, literally, because they're the most viral things. So yeah. like you can just take exactly what that is and then make it on your own. Yeah. And you don't, you're not expecting to get a hundred million views on this thing like Mr. Beast got on some whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Cause you're like, well, if I got a hundred thousand, that would be killer. Uh -huh. So I'll just do that. And then maybe later on in your journey, you'll get to a point where you're the one that everyone else is ripping off. But in the meantime, time like you're just trying new things and seeing what works with you and if you have your own niche which at that moment is d3 college athletes that are making a living on online there's that's a pretty like specific yeah. little niche then good for you man nobody else is doing it anyways yeah yeah i definitely agree and like if you're out there and you're you feel bad about you know kind of copying someone's content it's like you can still get popular and you know or you could still win and be a copier like yeah. you could still win and just flat out copy someone's content i think the only and, the just the one big ethical thing is like don't pretend you're not stealing like just tell us yeah like that's it, just tell thing. people right if you are copying something i have this idea because of this yeah you know what i mean like my idea and I, like i said i could point out anything where i say who are you and what are you passionate about that's stolen from the minimalists <laughs> that is like a, a uh, they put out a documentary there's several books and in it in i want to say in the book everything that remains uh the writer i forget what his name is josh something um he said it's much more interesting for me to ask somebody not what they do for a living but what are they passionate about mm -hmm. i stole it from that nobody knows that because i've never said it till now but that's where i took it from but yeah. i don't pretend that i came up with it out of like I, it came from somewhere just ask me and i'll tell you yeah and it's huge on like I spoke about it earlier, but people flat out copy videos and change one little thing. And they're some of the biggest creators on social media. Every, every Instagram reel is just a copy of something else. And then it just keeps going on and on like yeah. the trends and TikTok dances, TikTok trends. They're all copied from the original place. And then a thousand people do it. And sometimes they flip it into their niche so for me it's football for someone else it might be their clothing brand but it works and like that's just how social media works so yeah. and it may change but for now yeah. that's the way things go and i think anybody who's fighting against the way something works just because they don't want to do it is just hurting themselves like yeah. look at how the game is played and you have to play within it maybe you don't like the rules of this game but that doesn't matter because that's what the rules are right yeah. like maybe goal you don't like the rule of you can't goaltend in basketball you want to be able whatever dude that's the that's the rule you got to play within it like yeah. deal with it so where do you find all your inspiration obviously like you're just like scrolling on tiktok and stuff but is there like a specific place that you look are there any resources for that or is it really just your feed that you find things on and screenshot them like how do you come up with ideas yeah kind of I, I i'd call it a content board kind of but it's really just my notes and my camera roll of different content ideas that people have done and they've worked S you know, sometimes they don't work for me, but you know, just the continuous, um, the continuous, um, search for content to remake and, um, make it my own way is kind of what I think will lead me into a successful journey on social media. I think you have to, I've talked to people that don't do that, which it blows my mind that they're successful without doing that versus like Sven Johnson. Do you know who that dude is? Yeah. Yeah. Sven's the fucking man. He was a guest on the show a while ago. Um, but he said he has like over a hundred ideas on his phone at any given time and he'll just like look and go, okay, well, which one's realistic that I could probably do today. How many video ideas would you say you have? Like how many things do you have saved that right now, if I was going to say, Hey, let's go make content. How many ideas would you have to choose from? 200 but oh my god okay. that's also thanks you know that's also different titles different ways to mm. different way different titles and thumbnails to make the same vlog pretty much sure so, like also shout out chat gpt like <laughs> give me give me 10 different title ideas for a day about you know what i eat in a day as a college athlete and it gives me 10 so yeah there's definitely resources out there to help you in that in that manner yeah, dude, I think people who are not looking at what AI can do for them are just kind of blowing it. Because, oh, dude, it's yeah. such a powerful tool that's evolving really fast that, like, yes, I think it's whack that AI will just steal people's artwork and, like, boom. 
I, I, getting ripped off as an artist, that sucks. However, people that are just totally ignoring what that tool could potentially do for them, dude, you're missing out hard. It's crazy. Um, all my videos I edit myself and... On what platform? I'm curious. What, how do you edit? Is Premiere. it Premiere? Premiere and Photoshop. And have you just like no. watched tutorials on YouTube for how to do that? Kind of. Kinda... I'll, I'll look up an effect or... Yeah, you know, keyframing, and I'll look it up, and then just keep doing that, and yeah, just little just piece build by piece your there. knowledge base. But yeah. I was, you know, one of my camera guys that records for me a lot. He's a video major, and he's like, "Dude, AI, you know, could do everything that I do." Yeah, and I've been putting all my pop up text myself, like cutting each text box. Um, the animation for popping up and like i just figured out that cap cut does it automatically oh my god dude yeah i learned how to do that a while ago and that saved me stupid amounts of time crazy yeah 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 i think there's a, a lot of ai tools i mean i that's a whole we could do three podcasts talking about ai and how that's going to change the world positively and negatively but in general it's one of the th those things you just have to be aware of of like what could potentially help you and you don't have to specifically use the idea that chat gpt or any of these ai programs give you but it may be what triggers you to think of something yeah you know what i mean just because you're brainstorming with this ai people mm -hmm. used to have you know rooms of people to brainstorm with now you can use a computer and it will also do that for you exactly <laughs> um what i'm always learning stuff so that's something that you just learned was how to use CapCut, which good for you i use a different app but still like it does similar things what is something right now that is a challenge that you're trying to figure out a solution to but you haven't figured it out yet i'd say so i vlog on youtube and that's pretty much all i can do i can't plan out a video for you know I can't plan out a video during the season because I just don't have time with class practice, etc. So different ways to package the same video pretty much. So all Ryan Trahan, do you, are you familiar? Mm -hmm. He's a YouTuber, you know, he's like second to Mr. Beast. He's huge. Oh, okay. Sure. All he does is go and do cool things. Like he'll go to the craziest Airbnbs, but the thumbnail and title are so eye-catching that people click so i'm trying and i'm struggling to find a way to package these vlogs throughout the season in a way that people want to watch because my name you know richie murphy is not a big enough reason for people to click right so there has to be another element of of that and d3 athlete you know it's it works sometimes because people are interested and in, you know the lifestyle but it's relatively small the amount of people that care about division three sports so yeah. i'm just trying to find a way to package these videos with thumbnails titles um that'll make them clickable i think it's hard i mean so basically what you're saying is you're just capturing a ton of content not knowing 100 percent sure what parts you'll use but then you have that resource once you have more time to edit through and make stuff from but if you're not being intentional with what you're recording in the first place it's really hard to have that come out to be a really good product a hundred percent a hundred percent and so that's what you're trying to figure out and it's hard yeah. like yeah every youtube video is so scripted to every single word like the yeah. biggest youtubers what shots what scenes but when you're vlogging you know it's just my life i'm not gonna go to a bears game bears packers game like i'm just living everyday life and you know and that enough or my life isn't enough to click on so i gotta find ways you know what does a d3 football player eat every day and stuff like that yeah different ways to vary up ultimately the same day in the life video i'm curious to see how successful you are with all this stuff when you no longer have college and sports to take up so much of your time i feel like things are going to explode but that's a lot of pressure as well to see where things are going to go but I, I can relate as far as like with the show I, this isn't scripted like i have a general idea like i got all these questions on my phone like yeah. i have a general idea and roadmap of where i want to go to a certain degree but i always I, the saying i tell myself all the time is be kind to yourself because i'm just doing the best i can with what's in front of me like i'm trying to be intentional with the things that i ask and the story that i'm telling but it's one take and it just kind of that's all i have to pull from yeah. you know what i mean yeah you talked about after football i think yeah. 
So that NIL, I asked 100 brands for NIL deals. Mm. That took me a month to film, edit, get all the packages, a whole month. And I knew that was going to do good. Like, I just, you know, it's a cool idea. People don't know about NIL NIL deals. They're interested. I knew it was going to do good. But, like, that type of effort I know is required for every video. And so... I'm kind of just hoping these vlogs do good. And a main reason for putting these vlogs out is I could look back when I'm 60. Oh, that was me in college. Like, you know, cool stuff like that. I vlogged my 21st, brought a GoPro into the bars. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, didn't, I, didn't, I put that on private. Yeah, but sure. But I'll still have that my whole life. And yeah. if nothing ever comes out of this and, you know, I stop making content, which won't happen, but for some reason I stop. I'll be able to look back on my life and like have a, you know, a forever keepsake of my entire college, you yeah. know, years. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing is, is you can't put too much pressure on yourself for every video to work. Sometimes you just like know something's going to work like you were explaining with that, but you can't expect every single one to go because it just doesn't really work that way. And I think part of it too is I think the algorithms themselves are still developing right now. Um, they always will be, but I think they're developing right now where sometimes things that aren't that great perform better than things that are really good, but you just have to put out a lot of quantity. You know what I mean? It's not exclusively quantity over quality, it is both, but right now I think it's more so on quantity than it is quality. You have to give it a lot of options of good stuff and not expect all of your good things to work because they're just like, they're just not going to. Yeah, exactly. When you're posting across platforms, like right now I know uh, the algorithms are figuring out like if this is original content or not, right? And that kind of plays into whether or not they push them. So for me, I'll cut clips from an interview, right? Because I understand that the vast majority of people who will see something from this interview will see a clip because not that many people want to sit down for an hour. Hopefully there'll be a bunch of people that watch for an hour, you know, but it, that's not how that's going to work, right? Most people are going to see a random clip. So I'll cut the clip and then I pretty much do what's called cross posting, right? So I'll post it on several platforms, the same mm -hmm. clip. How do you decide, because I know you do that as well, which platform to post to first? Um, or do you post it to all three within five minutes? All three within five. Is there much. a strategy to yeah, like... Yeah, if it's a, you know, the, the kind of the idea that algorithm algorithms are just random is a little bit like, I feel like misleading, you know, but, you know, the biggest, sorry, the biggest creators say that the algorithm is they figured it out, you know? Sure, yeah. So it's in a way you gotta, you, you gotta listen to the teacher and why not listen to the best teacher? But I post all of them within five minutes. I feel like if it's a good enough video for the audience, then it'll keep growing because you know, people like the, if everyone that saw it within the first three minutes liked it, it would keep growing. Yeah. So, um, but that's not to say that some videos do really good on Instagram and the same video doesn't do great on TikTok. Yeah. So it's just more of getting out content every day and the consistency behind it. Um, and I think it'll lead me the right way. Yeah. And that's what I mean by like qu quantity with quality, but you have to give the, you just have to give the quantity. Like they, you have to be able to do both. I mean, I agree. If something's really good, people are just going to see it and it's, it's going to do well. But I've just seen videos that I don't think are, great do much better than videos than i think are great on a good number of occasions it's not totally random i'm just yeah. saying that i think it's it's still developing how do you treat the different platforms right now like where do you think you where do you think let's say somebody who hasn't done any of it right they want to get into content creation and let's say they're a freshman going into going into college not necessarily to play football and create content that way but they want to start doing content which platform do you think is the most important? How would you, if you were starting over, how would you uh, dedicate your time and strategy based on the different platforms? Would it all go towards YouTube? Would it kind of be spread? What would you do? Um, I mean, it kind of depends on if you just want to start making content or you want to make this, you want to make money off of it, Let's I guess. Let's say we want to make money off of it. YouTube, 100%. Um, post your first video. It's going to suck, Never not get a single view, but if you keep posting every single week for a year, like, 
And it's crazy. If you posted a video for a year and dedicated yourself for one year, how much you would grow and learn most importantly, because for the next year, you're going to keep building on that. So first 10 videos get 10 views. Okay. Who cares? Change one thing, every video that you think is a reason they didn't watch. Um, and like, it's crazy. Cause if you, de if you really dedicated, if anybody dedicated themselves to making content for 10 years, you know, 15 years, they're going to be massive and yeah. they're going to win. There's zero way you can't. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's just about repetition, right? So many people hold themselves back from posting in the first place until they have this thing as perfect as it can possibly be. And then they're bummed if it doesn't work out. But like, how many times does somebody practice shooting a free throw? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's over and over and like hundreds of thousands of times for them to get really good at it. The same thing is going to happen with putting out content. Everything that you put out, every video you put out, they're not all going to be good. You can't expect them to be good. Even once you get better, you're still going to have things that don't particularly work. But I said this off mic earlier, you have to make a mistake to learn from the mistake. Yeah, right. Otherwise exactly. you're not going to know how or why this thing works. So you have to just keep doing it more and more and more, which for me has been a little bit tough because I, I'll, I'll post things and I'll make videos and I'll like, I'll post all these clips and then I'll get haters on the internet. This person critiqued, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. It wasn't like the best thing I've ever put out now that it's like came out. I understand why, but instead of getting down on myself, I try to tell myself, well, now I know why that didn't work. So I don't do that in the future. You know what I mean? And then say, well, the show is only going to get better overall, you know, not necessarily every episode is going to keep going, but it's like yeah. it overall will get better if I just keep doing it. And that really is the big takeaway for anybody with anything is you only fail when you stop doing it. You're not, yeah. otherwise you're not failing. Exactly. <laughs> but I love that. That drives me a lot. Like, you know, the only way you fail is to stop making content. I love that. It, I probably think about that like every other day, you know, yeah. it's just the simple fact that I'm getting better and it doesn't really matter about anything else. Yeah. You know? Well, and thankfully you're at a point where you already are aware, like you'll be able to make a living straight out of college. Yeah. You know? It'll be, it'll, you know, my plan for after college is my girlfriend is, uh, takes, is going to school to take x-rays. So she's kind of cement where she can go around a hospital or whatever. Yeah. So wherever she decides that, you know, she wants to work, I'll move there with her. I will probably serve or bartend Friday, Saturday sure. and I can and make videos the rest of the, the week. Yeah. And I wouldn't be happier doing, you know, anything else. Sure. So that's my goal. And if it never grows exponentially, like I, I want it to. Yeah. I'll still be very happy doing that. You hey know? man, if you can make a living having that kind of freedom, you know what I mean? That's everything. And I think it's just like, even if the videos don't necessarily perform, you're still learning more and more from all the other avenues, all the other like facets of what the job is, where you'll get to a point where it works, right? Like I look at, in, in different times, it'll pop off better than others, right? So like YouTube shorts was really, really popping for anyone who was doing it at all, because there's just not that many people doing it. And then it kind of slowed down, right? So like I had a few months where just like consistently I was getting more views on YouTube shorts. And it's not that I got worse at doing them. It's just, there's more people that are doing it and I need to continue to develop it. However, mm -hmm. what I try to look at is just the number of overall views, not at how much I had this month because like I want that to go up, but I'm not trying to focus on that. I'm trying to focus on what are the overall views, which, without having anything ever go viral, I'm stoked about this. I know this isn't a big number for like a lot of people, but I'm jazzed because I think my most viewed video is like 16,000 or something. I just hit a million. Let's go. Yeah, dude, like I'm so stoked because I didn't even really try to use YouTube until like November. That's yeah. when I started working on it and I hit 100,000 views January 9th. But like two or three days ago, I, f I was like watching it every day. I'm almost there, almost there. Finally hit a million. And even if nothing takes off, it's never going to go below a million. Yeah. So <laughs> you always have that, you know, I, I'm already past a million and it's only going to keep going. So I'm excited to see where the show goes. Um, because like I told you, my shops closed now, which was sad, but I was really ready to move on to this next chapter. But me just imagining what am I going to be capable of without having to juggle that much 
like i'm gonna keep improving like the show's gonna get better if people hate it now that's fine it, yeah it'll exactly. be better in a year from now so i'm excited what are your uh plans for the content itself when you're no longer in the locker room doing stuff based on college athletes do you have any so, idea of where you want it to pull you um i would like to do it more of like um so I ordered a hundred dollars worth of like Timu football products, Sick. and it'll be. I bought the cheapest football helmet on Timu, and oh. I expect that to do well, and just kind of content around sports like that. Um, okay. And yeah, it definitely will change as I grow and you know learn how to title, but it'll be something around sports, football, basketball, and yeah. I'm I'm excited for the opportunity to change up my content a little bit because the vlogs are getting monotonous and not not performing how I would like them to, I guess. Yeah. So but yeah, I'm I'm still excited to vlog this year. Yeah. Um but afterward I'm ready to be done. So Yeah. I know what you mean. You do anything long enough, it loses its luster. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. because you've already had success in it, you've already tried this thing. You know it may or may not work to a certain degree, but like you already have that plan laid out. The excitement of like the possibilities are endless is really exciting. You yeah. know what I mean? That's what's like a oh my God, I can do anything now. Like yeah. where is this gonna take me? For some that's daunting and it is to a certain degree, but like for me that's really motivating because it's like, well, I'm not like all that yet. And I don't, it's never gonna be all that, but you know what I mean? Like I'm, what I've achieved so far, at least, especially in my mind is like nothing in comparison to what it could be. So I'm like really excited to see where I can take it. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's coming towards the end of the show. Um, so two things, one, I want to give you a gift some, of some chocolate. Do you like chocolate? I love chocolate. Dope dude. Have you ever heard of Mayana chocolate? Um, I don't think so. Well, they're from Northern Wisconsin. They're made in Spooner. Oh, really? Yeah, dude. They're like chocolate factories in Spooner. So I'll give you, you can choose which one. Do you like spicy chocolate or not? I know it's kind of like a thing some people love or people hate. Do you like it? I'm not a spicy person. All right, I'll take it. Okay, well, I'll give you both. How's that? I got <laughs> uh, spicy. So there's the Maya, Mayan Spice Bar Mini, and then I have the Coffee Break Mini because you like coffee, right? Yeah. These, MayanaChocolate.com, you can use the promo code PASSION for 25% off. But honestly, it's, in my opinion, by far the best chocolate that I've ever had in my life. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's fantastic. Okay, so I always ask everyone on the show to share a story of a unique experience that they've gotten to have that they're really grateful for, but it only happened because they pursued their passion for, in this case, content creation. Can you share a story? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's so many things, so many benefits of chasing your passions, but I'd say like the biggest thing for me is like the people around me that really don't care about social media are kind of, you know, they're kind of impressed by me. So one of my AAU coaches, Tom Reuter, he just messaged me about the quick trip deal. And he's like, congrats. Like, this is awesome. I guarantee you, he doesn't even know how to work Instagram, sure. but it's just kind of the fact that, you know, I can do something that makes people proud of me, Yeah, I guess in a way. Sure. And just the drive that the drive and passion that, making content has given me is something that everybody should chase and try and get like the very first video that I made, I propped up my phone making a playing black ops two sure. on my Xbox 360. Yeah. I posted that on YouTube. I swear that is the most like energized and alive I've ever felt. Sure. And it was just something so simple and it. And it just like, yeah, I think everyone should strive to find their passion if they don't already know it. And if they know it, what are you waiting for? For real, dude, I think what it is is people are afraid of being bad at that thing and they're afraid of failing. But what they don't understand is by not doing it, you're failing. You're already failing. So exactly. it, it doesn't, if you go and try and you fail, you're only failing less than you were before because at least you did it, you just did it poorly. You know, yeah. so and that and that isn't just videos. I mean, that's kind of anything. But like, there is a, a, a content creation. It's not just like influencers, but just content creation. Things are moving more and more and more online. Like all of life is moving more online. And content creation could be creating logos for people. That could be creating artwork for you know whatever. It could be creating websites. There's like so many different ways that aren't being an influencer that are creating. 
So yeah, whatever your thing is, just start doing that. And then once you do the one time, whatever that thing is, that starts the like all the momentum. And then you just keep doing it. And what's really fun is at the beginning is when you see the most growth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because like the first time you do something, you suck. So there's so many areas that you saw what you exactly. did poorly that the next one's way better. The, the hard part for, I think, a lot of people, well, that's the first, the hardest part is just doing it once. But the hard part for a lot of people after that is they see this exponential growth and then it starts to taper off because they've like learned a lot and now it's smaller things they have to fix and they're not quite as obvious on how to fix them. What do you think is something that you need to fix that's holding you back right now? I think it's more of just showing my personality on camera like it's still hard for me and i have done 250 videos on sure. youtube like it's just continually showing my personality being myself because even if you're if you're not yourself and you're acting a certain way if you're successful what's like the best case scenario that you still feel crappy because you're just acting right and you don't think people like you for you like if you do half of good, half as good being yourself, hey, this is me, you know, yeah. like it or leave it. If you like me, keep watching. But if you don't, you know, there's more creators out there. So it's just being myself and trying to get an audience for trying to get an audience that likes me for me and not because I know how to get engagement on videos. Dude, it's really hard to be yourself and be genuine on the internet because being criticized for being yourself is really hard. It's like if you're if you're putting up some kind of a front and something doesn't do well and somebody critiques you, it's a little easier to understand and like accept that hater because you're like, yeah, well, at least you don't hate me, you just hate this thing. Mm -hmm. But when you're yourself and somebody doesn't like you, it's like, it hurts, man. It sucks. And it's, it's one of the things that holds a lot of people back is cause they're not, they can't accept that people aren't going to like the genuine them. You know what I mean? Like I face that too. But the problem is if you don't be exactly who you are, you're going to try to carry this facade forever. And it's not, it just isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. Like people can see through it. They just really can. It just, it just won't work. The yeah. only way to work is to be willing to be vulnerable and be yourself online. It's, yeah. And people are drawn to that. Even if you don't do anything all that crazy cool, people just like when people are genuine, like that will carry a lot of things on its own. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, dude, thank you so much for driving all the way over here. I know this was like an entire day trip, almost as far as me driving to Canada. <laughs> Just kidding. But thank you for driving over here and connecting with me. This was fun. We'll have to make some more content and stuff after this together. I Like, like I said, I, I, we have our network spread out throughout the world internationally. But it's still really dope when you meet people that are like, you can actually see them in person periodically, yeah. right? Like 100%. my friend Jaren or Darton, or there's like a lot of people around. That's part of why I've been kind of more intentionally interviewing people in the Midwest. Um, not only because I do all my interviews in person, but I like to be able to maintain relationships with these people like after the interview, you know what I mean? Because we get to have a unique experience doing this. How many times do you talk with somebody at length, like hour plus, about what something that you really care about and they're genuinely interested in asking like this type of a conversation is not one that you have with people all that often so yeah. there's like this unique bond that we have now forever that like i'm this old dude who interviewed you when you were in college before you were a big deal and then you're going to be a huge deal like yeah. mr beast and then i'm going to be texting you like bro why does my youtube channel still suck help me out you're going to be my resource now all right okay perfect well, um what song should we end? What, what song oh, should we First of all, thanks for having me. First podcast ever. Yeah. I was a little nervous, but thanks for letting me tell my story. Uh, we'll have to stay in touch, though. But, yeah, we could do a part two anytime. Man. Yeah. Make sure if you're in the Menominee area, pop out to a stout home football game. Uh, <laughs> come see me play in the Blue Devils. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, dude. It was an honor. It's always cool when I get to be the first one to share somebody's story. Like, to me... I'm sure you, if you would have reached out to various podcasts, you could have done one a long time ago. So the fact that you chose this one to be your first one, I'm honored and it was dope. Especially because it was in person. Like, this yeah. is awesome. Yeah. I love this. Someone, passion is amazing. Like, seeing someone else passionate about something makes you passionate. Yeah. You know. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon.